This is the great Australian outback. We are in the Northern Territory, in the middle of nowhere. This is Land Cruiser country. So the last car you'd expect to see here would be a Porsche and an EV at that, being driven by Mark Webber. Mate, hop in, we need to talk. Porsche is one brand that's not afraid to push boundaries. Usually those boundaries involve top speeds and lap times, so pushing EV driving boundaries is really quite different. The goal of this trip is to drive from Darwin to Tennant Creek in an electric vehicle. That's a thousand kilometres through the Australian outback. Our day one goal is Catherine, 320 kilometres south on the Stewart Highway which connects Darwin to Adelaide. Once you get out of Darwin's city limits, the highway speed limit soon hits 130 kilometres an hour, the highest in Australia. The Porsche is effortless at this speed, but it's not the best for battery charge management. We're averaging 28 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometres. We stop at Pine Creek for lunch and take the opportunity to plug the car in because the battery is reporting 31% charge remaining. The Pine Creek Roadhouse has a 20 kilowatt hour charger which adds about 80 kilometres to each of the two Taycans in our convoy while we chow down on steak sandwiches. After lunch I grab some time with Mark Webber to find out what he's doing here, why is Porsche doing this and how is his Aussie F1 protege Oscar Piastri handling a tumultuous first season at McLaren. Now in case you don't know, Mark competed in Formula 1 from 2002 to 2012 winning multiple races with Red Bull and almost a championship. These days he manages Australia's latest F1 driver, the highly talented Oscar Piastri. Mark, welcome back to Oz, mate. Is it good to be home? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's always good to come back to Oz. It's not home um, in terms of I don't live here, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, and we're on a pretty cool mission here, mate, with Porsche, so yeah, looking forward to it. Do you spend a lot of time travelling? Where do you call home? Uh, Monaco's home, so uh, yeah, been down there for quite a while now. Uh, it's super central. I uh, can drive to a lot of tracks. You can drive to Barcelona, Mugello, Monza, Ricard. Uh, so race circuit wise, it's, it's very central. Uh, love my cycling, love the outdoors. So Cote d'Azur has got some phenomenal riding. Um, so yeah, but as you say, mate, a lot of lot of flying still. I uh, haven't backed off too much, uh, and and yeah, love my work. It's uh, motorsport's been awesome to me. So you snuck back here during Formula One's summer break. How long are you here for? Uh, about 20 days, actually. So um, I'll head back for the Italian Grand Prix. Um, actually missing Zandvoort, so just to get a bit more time uh, away. But uh, yeah, it's um, yeah good to be back and uh, turn the phone off for a while while the industry is on holidays over there. <laughs> nice, nice. Before the summer break uh, kicked in, Oscar had some pretty strong results in Formula One. Uh, how are you guys feeling for the second half of the year? Uh, yeah, look, he's establishing himself very well. Um, you know, it's it's uh, as a rookie in Formula One, it's it's obviously extremely challenging uh, to learn the new circuits, uh, learn the sort of all the new compounds of tyres. Uh, just putting all the weekends together, it's um, it, it can be quite quite challenging. But obviously, Oscar's doing his absolute utmost to make that as seamless as possible, which is uh, off the back of a year out last year, which no racing driver wants to have a year out from racing. Yeah. Um, so he did have that. But ultimately, mate, I think it's been a phenomenal first part of the season for him. He's done well. He's learning a lot. I think that, um, you know, the back end of the season, hopefully, is more of the same. I don't think we can expect too much more. I think uh, he's doing what he's been doing up to this point. Uh, that's that's a highly impressive first season. and Just keep building on that in the next few years. So we're filming this in August, it goes to air in late September, the season will have resumed. Do you think there's a chance by the time people are watching this that Oscar's stood on the podium again? Uh, yeah, I mean, I know it's very uh, often the case in Australia, people, we're not the most patient race in the world in terms of our results. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that uh, got to remember what you're up against. Um, there's there's lots of guys which are, uh, you know, fighting for the top step. So I think that, um, you know, he's, if the opportunity's there, and he's obviously you know, he's going to have to drive very, very well to get that. Uh, but uh, I think that, you know, let's just, uh, steps at a time, literally, pardon the pun, but each step at a time for him to uh, to realise that. Uh, obviously, he had a sprint podium, you know, a shorter race format, but obviously a, a Grand Prix podium would be, of course, extraordinary, but let's not get too carried away. And he actually led that race for a brief moment. Um, 
Daniel's back in Formula One. We've got two Aussies in Formula One. I'm getting the message here. We should just learn to celebrate that, right? And not um, put so much expectation on Australian drivers. Uh, well, I think that, you know, yeah, we, we should be, you know, there was a 25, I think it was a 25 year gap between myself and Alan Jones in terms of success in, in Formula One. I think it's very easy for us to get carried away that, you know, it's just that we have a given right to have drivers in F1. That's just not the case. Uh, you know, obviously Daniel's now back in after um, you know a challenging phase in, in, in the sort of middle to back end of his career. He's trying to get going again now, which is you know every opportunity that he will. Um, but you know, there's as we know, the field's hot. Everyone's um, everyone's got uh, you know their own battles to fight, and, and um, you know all the South Americans, Europeans, Scandinavians. Like it's a, the field, the depth of the field's always been extremely strong. So to have two from Australia um, is a real feather in our cap. And, um, you know, Oscar and Daniel get on well. Um, obviously the press try and, you know, create some other uh, challenges around that. But obviously, you know, often they're uh, extremely wide of the mark and the two boys are just happy to be there representing the country to the best of their ability. Yeah, mate, that is fantastic. All right, mate, now to the burning question. I mean, what are we doing here? We are in a Porsche Taycan EV. We're um, somewhere between Darwin and our eventual destination of Tennant Creek, a thousand kilometres south. Yeah. What are we doing? <laughs> well, yeah, we've got the uh, Porsche Taycan here, and I think that um, you know what Porsche has never been shy of doing is is taking their products into into you could say challenging environments. Whether it's you know look at the early days of the 959, you know the the, the Dakar experience around that, Jackie X back in the day, um, you know the just released the Dakar car, the 911, and obviously now with these with these EVs, you know, we've seen with the Cross Turismo and lots of cars that we've done that we can really be dependable on how reliable the cars are, how robust they are, uh, and the range to get us through such a trip that you've just mentioned. So, um, yeah, it's uh, taking them, I suppose people could be intimidated by taking such a car like this or other, you know, the opposition might be, but, um, you know, Porsche, again, uh, happy to take the challenge on, not intimidated by anything, and, uh, it's good that you guys can come here and cover it, mate. Yeah, mate, I'm very, very stoked to get this opportunity. I am honestly surprised. I mean, we talk a lot on the east coast of Australia about the lack of charging stations. Um, so it is a very bold move, but I've actually been surprised that we're not having too much trouble finding charging stations in the middle of nowhere. Pretty, pretty phenomenal, isn't it? Like, um, you know, yesterday's one at lunch was, was pretty creative, but obviously you plan ahead a little bit and, um, nailed it you know it's amazing if you can just leapfrog your way down the road and just get a top up here and there where you can in around a lunch break or you know obviously overnight uh, when you, you know, obviously you're sleeping anyway it's a bit like a mobile phone you're always waking up the next morning you know with a full charge ready to go um, and that's been um, something that's been as you say a, a pleasant surprise for us okay one, one more question yeah. um, you made your career out of internal combustion engine cars. You finished your career as a racing driver when hybrids were really to, coming to the fore. You've done a fair few miles in pure electric cars. Uh, do they excite you? They do. I mean, the tech for me it was, I was blown away when I drove the 919 for the first time, which is the Porsche you know, Le Mans winning car and, and World Championship winning car. So to have that exposure as a racing driver for the technology that we use there, uh, which again was a 800 volt battery in that car, which we have in this car today. So the, the, the transfer of technology, Porsche, you know, I've worked with quite a few manufacturers. There is no one that has that level of confidence to go from the racetrack to the street cars like, like Porsche do. So as a racing driver, of course, we want performance, we want reliability, we want acceleration, we want torque, we want, uh, you know, smart software and, and everything that this car encapsulates, whether it's, you know, the seating position, the ergonomics, the, the screen, everything is Porsche top-notch sports car. Doors closing, you know, wind noise, I know acoustically the engine's not there, but the wind noise in terms of how, just how tight this car is put together, uh, you know, that's where, you know, it's, it's, it's really market leading. So I'm proud actually to see the journey that Porsche have gone on with the EVs because I think that, um, you know, we're, we're getting going um, and, you know, we don't, you know, t you know go into these obviously you, you know, new segments. Obviously, you know, lighthearted Porsche as always want to be the best in the business. All right, mate, so you're only with us for a couple, the first couple of days. Yeah. And then your diary being what it is, you've got to head off. Yeah. So I guess we better put the pedal to the metal you're going to be late for your flight. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, mate. How fast can this car go? Uh, well over 250k an hour. It's a shame that we can no longer do that in the Northern Territory. We can't. The fun police have stopped all that, mate. So, uh, 
I'll let up to, leave it up to you if you want it, mate. I'm, uh, I, yeah. I, need, I need to, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Day one draws to an end in Catherine, 320 kilometres south on the Stewart Highway. It wasn't exactly the toughest day and the two cars made it easily thanks to that lunchtime top up. We plug the cars in and head to our dinner location, a barge on the Catherine Gorge. I tell you, nothing makes you feel as insignificant as cruising along a river gorge that has been here for over 1650 million years. For the record, that's 1400 million years earlier than the dinosaurs. Day two's challenge is to drive from Catherine to Daly Waters, another 280 kilometres all up, with a lunch stop along the way. Out here, Porsches attract a fair bit of attention, parked as they are in amongst the Land Cruisers, Hiluxes and other real four-wheel drives. Locals are not so much shocked by the intrusion of a couple of German EVs as they are bemused. Driving the Stuart Highway is not the toughest test of automotive metal, and we're not the only EVs out here, but we are still very much in the minority. The publicans at the Larimer Wayside Inn have a thing for the Pink Panther. There are dozens of these Hollywood icons dotted around the place, including one in an ultralight keeping an eye on our Porsche while we get lunch. We plug the cars in again and are surprised to see another 20 kilowatts coming down the pipe. Two hours on the charger nets another 80 kilometres or so for each of our two car convoy and costs us a somewhat exorbitant $40. There's no fee per kilowatt out here, so instead they assume you're staying overnight and charge us the cost of a site rental. After lunch, I drag Mike Weinkotter into the car with me. Mike is Porsche's spokesman for future mobility and has come to Australia to do this drive with us. Yeah, so I'm the spokesperson for Taycan, the model line. I'm also overlooking the Mission X project and also the e-mobility subject with a focus on charging infrastructure. Right, okay, so very, very future focused. Absolutely, yeah. Everything with an E for e-mobility, electrification, that's really under my belt and uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying these topics because they're really progressive and they're talking to the future, something I, I really like. Yeah, cool. Have you, um, obviously we're driving Taycan EVs through the Australian Outback, have you driven EVs in any other uh, extreme areas? I actually did. In the beginning of the year we took some Taycans uh, to India and we drove from uh, Mumbai to Hyderabad to watch the very first Formula E race in India, wow. where okay. Porsche was quite successful. So that was uh, a good experience as well, uh, struggling with the, with the charging infrastructure and making it work with the traffic. Uh, very good adventure, very different from this scenery, obviously, but also very extreme on the other hand. Yeah, um, this trip has actually surprised me with the charging infrastructure. The um, Australian infrastructure gets a bad name on the East Coast because there's simply too many EVs for the charge points. Yet here in the outback where I was expecting there to be none, we've actually had very little trouble finding them. Has this trip been easier or harder than your expectations coming in? It's much easier than I anticipated because I was not expecting to have so much power on these camping grounds where we were mainly charging. Plus, having the option to charge overnight really made this trip much, much easier than I anticipated. So it's, it has been very pleasant to drive here, actually. It's kind of cool, too, Porsche pushing boundaries of, uh, I guess, EV acceptance and what EVs can do. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, you have to have a certain amount of range. You have to have some charging speed. Um, and this is also where the, the Taycan really pays off with its technology, since you can charge the car AC with up to 22 kilowatts. That gives you really fast charging, even if you are on slower sites, just as a camping ground, for instance. Yeah, cool, cool. If we have a, a, a talk further about your uh, e-mobility portfolio, obviously Porsche is looking at a couple of areas um, of future propulsion, electric vehicles like the Taycan, but also very, very heavily investing in e-fuels. I mean, how, how does Porsche decide which of those two strategies is appropriate for its various models? Yeah, it, it really depends on where in the lifetime the, the model line is at the moment. If you have a new, completely new model line coming up, it's more likely to be electric. But uh, as you know, we also have the very iconic 911, and that's supposed to be the last car that is going to be electrified. And for this model line, we definitely uh, are relying on e-fuels, which is also a very environmentally friendly and sustainable uh, way of running these cars for a long time. How do you reckon the enthusiasts will respond to an electric 911? Um, I think by the time, and if we ever do it, um, the technology will be so advanced and 
EV will be the new normal. I think the the the, the way that people appreciate and accept this technology will be much much higher than it is today. Doing it today would not be the, the best and smartest idea, to be fair. But by the time we eventually do it, the technology will be much more advanced than it is today. You say eventually, so uh, I guess we can't accurately predict, but we're talking tens of years, 20 more? Um, it's difficult to, to put a, a year tag on it, but we're always claiming that by 2030, 80% of all new Porsches will be fully electric. And that's obviously not including the, the 911 model line. And from a charging perspective, for me, even more impressive, it's supposed to charge twice as fast as a Taycan. So that is really, really, really high tech. Yeah, right. And that's, I guess, one area where EVs are still, um, I guess it's a not a criticism, but it's just a fact of EVs that they do take time to charge. I mean, out here on this trip with the Taycan, well, we've been lucky in that we've found a lot of 22 kilowatt um, chargers which is half the amount of time we thought we'd be spending, but we still are having to allow, you know, three to four hours a day to charge. But do you see that reducing a lot with the new 900 volt architecture, or do you think in 10, 15 years, we're still looking at substantial charging times? No, I think charging time will go down dramatically. Um, so eventually the charging time will not take longer than fueling up a car. I mean, that's far out, that's future talk, but uh, uh, simulations are there and it's definitely going to happen as a process. It just takes a little bit of time, but technology is advancing so quickly and so fast. Yeah. We've been getting a lot of looks on this trip with an electric Taycan in the outback. Have, yeah. have you um, had any feedback from any Australians? Not really, because we have been so remote that you, you hardly talk to other people than the, the ones who are in our group. Uh, but you can t tell that people are aware that this is something special, something different. Uh, they don't hear any noise from an engine coming. So they are, they are aware that this is an, a different animal. Uh, well, today we're finishing up at Tennant Creek, which is the end of my stage of this journey. So maybe we can uh, park in the main street and see what reactions we get. Yeah, I would love to see some reactions and get some feedback what people think out here of a fully electric uh, Taycan. The cruise into Daly Waters proves uneventful. In fact, this whole trip is proving very uneventful. The cars are doing it easily and there are more than enough charges along the way that even a car with less than 250 kilometre range would not struggle. Daly Waters is not so much a town as a pub and a caravan park that has been given a massive tourist makeover. The main street is lined with old cars, old trucks, old buses and even old planes parked by some long ago patrons that have simply never bothered to move them. The pub is typical of many outback pubs. The walls are covered with paraphernalia left by previous customers from all corners of the world. There's banknotes from dozens of countries, driver's licenses, hastily scribbled notes, hats, shirts and even bras hanging from the ceiling. The beer is cold and the food is huge. That too is something Outback pubs have in common. Day three begins as day two ended with a huge meal at the Daily Waters pub. Then we hit the road for Tennant Creek, drives, finishing line. The trip computer says I'm going to make it easily, so easily that I don't need to worry about engaging the Taycan's specially programmed range driving mode, which takes all kinds of measures to increase driving range, including reducing the car's top speed, lowering the ride height, reducing headlight intensity and air conditioning effectiveness, and even turning off the passenger's digital display, all in the name of conserving power. Still with the electrons to spare, I do a little scientific investigation. I discover that at 90 kilometers an hour, the Taycan is consuming 23 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Up that speed to 110, and it's drawing 27 kilowatt hours down the pipe. At 130 kilometers an hour, it's drawing 32 kilowatt hours down the wires. That suggests anything from 300 kilometers to 400 kilometers on a full charge. Pulling into Tennant Creek on the end of the third day and I now know the answer to the question, can you drive an EV through the outback? The answer is yes, easily, as long as you stick to the main road and plan your charging points. And you're not in a hurry. The more pertinent question is, would you choose to drive an EV through the outback? For me, the answer is no because there's a lot of sitting around waiting for the car to charge and out here, Range anxiety is very much an issue. Heck, out here it's an issue for petrol and diesel powered cars, but in an EV you need to be hyper aware and you need to be prepared. All up we did a thousand kilometres from Darwin to Tennant Creek 
in a Porsche EV over three days. For sightseers, that pace is probably fast enough. For people who need to get where they're going, an EV wouldn't cut it out here, not even one as fast as a Porsche. Not yet, anyway. Thank you.